Good morning and welcome to today's compliance event looking at mitigating risk to your company. People are still joining, but I think we should probably get started anyway. Our customs expert, Keith Robe, who himself worked for HMRC for over 30 years, will give an overview of the new customs rules for trading between the UK and the EU, and specifically at how these changes could leave you at risk of HMRC compliance breaches. With the risk always on the importer, Keith will detail how to save time and money and make the processes work as well as they possibly can for your company. There'll be a couple of short polling questions before the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we hope you can take the time to help us by answering them. However, before we begin, just a few very quick housekeeping items to note. Attendees are going to be in listening mode only, and only the panellists' videos are visible when they're speaking. If you want to talk to the panellists or engage or ask a question, please do so by typing your question in the Q&A function at the Zoom control bar at the bottom of your screen. Aaron Moran and I will be moderating any questions during the Q&A session after the presentation today. And we're not going to be using the chat function with so many people on the call. Um, and finally, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available to Make UK members on the website afterwards. So with no further ado, please let me hand over to Keith Robe. Thanks, Hilary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Customs Compliance uh, webinar, where we'll be looking at um, effectively how to uh, mitigate some of the costs, some of the duty liabilities that you uh, might have come across since uh, we left the EU uh, at the beginning of this year, um, both um, for exports um, from the UK um, that you might be sending into the EU and for imports that you're bringing in um, at the same time. So. A little bit of a double-edged sword there because I'll also be looking at uh, the prospect of, of HMRC starting to um, look at what's been going on for um, the last nine months plus just over um, to, to make sure that people are still complying with customs regulations and it's um, it's been conveyed to me that HMRC are now getting their act together after after um, interruptions by by COVID and some of the transitional arrangements that they've put in place, and and we'll be looking very shortly to be um, getting out there to check that what's been happening for the uh, uh, year so far. Businesses are, are sticking to customs legislation and doing what they should have been doing um, in order to get their goods uh, moving across borders. Um, and I'll cover those areas as we go through. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, this is probably on your um, original information about this particular course. I spent quite a long time, as you can see, there working for Customs and Excise and latterly at HMRC, um, and mainly in the uh, the role of, of customs law and facilitations. Uh, for those of you who might have been around for a reasonable amount of time, um, my last role within HMRC was as an international trade development liaison officer which was probably the last of the face-to-face -face, uh, customs staff um, traveling around the UK, um, speaking to businesses and explaining what was going to be coming over the horizon for some of the, the new programs that were in place at that particular time. Um, as it says there, um, I'm an expert in, in authorized economic operator, the Trusted Trader Program, uh, and I've been uh, working um, in different countries, uh, in, in addition with the EU, when the UK was part of the EU, with EU customs uh, representing them uh, in some foreign clients. Right, what we're looking at here today, uh, the webinar, we'll be looking at the key areas that customs will concentrate on. Should you happen to get um, a letter from them in the, in the near future, saying that they're planning to come out and carry some kind of audit out on your uh, international trade um, Activities from a customs point of view, whether that's importing and or exporting. And these are the key areas that uh, customs will concentrate on if they come out to do that audit. It's the usual suspects, but I'll take you through the areas that they will be concentrating their um, uh, matters on to make sure that you're doing things correctly um, uh, and in the, the right fashion as far as legislation is concerned. Um, what do we mean by international trade? Well, it, it's a lot simpler now that we've left the EU. One of the few things that has become simpler, I, I suppose I should say, is that 
Um, international trade is the import of goods from outside of the UK and the export of goods uh, outside of the UK. So sending goods out and receiving goods. It's made a little bit simpler in the sense of um, whilst we were part of the customs union in the EU, uh, those borders were the EU borders with 28 different countries. Um, it's a lot more simple now that it's uh, it's the shores of the of the UK. I won't go into uh, GB and, and Northern Ireland uh, during the course of this event, but uh, there is some anomalies um, involved there. But goods to and from the EU are still record, recorded as acquisitions and dispatches for those of you who are involved in that area uh, with your VAT returns for the time being anyway, but it's hoped that um, Eventually, the interest that the requirement for interest that will disappear once uh, customs is up and running and fully uh, organised with making import and export declarations to and from the EU. Um, but at the moment, interest that is still required, but also import and export declarations uh, are required for movements to and from the EU. One of the key areas I'm sure uh, most of you will be aware of is that in order to uh, move goods. Uh, either in or out of the UK GB, then you need to have an economic operator registration or EORI number. Uh, quite simple, and a lot of publicity given to this about 12 months ago when the HMRC found out they had a problem uh, registering people for this. Um, the EORI number for a, a GB company is GB, uh, the, the two digit monitor for, for, for the UK, followed by your nine digit VAT registration number, and an additional three digits. That number will allow a customs declaration, either import or export, to be made under that EORI number. Um, if you're not that registered, um, I, I dare say we haven't got uh, any particular members who, who are not that registered, but perhaps we have, then you can apply for and be given um, uh, in an EORI number, um, which is obviously does not constitute your VAT registration number. But the EORI number goes on all VAT register declarations, uh, sorry, customs declarations. Um, I'll talk about very briefly about Chief, the customs handling of import and export freight. It currently uh, processes all customs declarations, whether they be import or export declarations. It has direct links to the, the major ports and airports uh, in the sense that they have software which speaks directly to Chief. Um, it's been upgraded to facilitate Brexit with the huge increase in the number of declarations that uh, require to be processed, um, but ultimately will be replaced by the new customs declaration service, which will be eventually the, uh, the single uh, customs mainframe computer uh, for the UK. Um, re fairly recently, HMRC announced that Chief will be um, unplugged, if I can put it that way, after the 31st of March, 2023, uh, from September, 2022, 30th of September, 2022, all uh, import declarations will have to be made on CDS and won't be done through Chief. And from the 31st of March, 2023, all export declarations will be required to go through CDS. And Chief will, on that date, become uh, non-operational. So the key areas um, that you will need to um, be aware of once customs start looking at uh, the compliance of any international trade business, the first thing to start with is the commodity code. This is really the, uh, the foundation of all that comes uh, afterwards. Uh, and that, that's establishing what the commodity code uh, for the goods that you actually deal in um, is and making sure it's accurate. It's an eight or 10 digit harmonized system code number. It has different names, uh, sometimes referred to as HS code, tariff code, or classification code. But in, in most cases, commodity code would be the term that uh, businesses will use to describe what it is. And there's a lot of information uh, on the gov.uk uh, website to guide you as to how you can classify your goods the general rules of interpretation are the official six rules that you need to follow to in, um, establish what your uh, commodity code is. Um, whilst there are six uh, GIRs as uh, described, the first one, uh, GIR1, is the one that the vast, vast majority of um, 
businesses are able to classify their goods under using the UK uh, global tariff uh, and using the chapter and the headings um, from that tariff. And then there are exceptions which follow in rules two to six. The uh, tariff itself is online. It's a very simple tool to use uh, in the sense of uh, how it actually will lead you through the, the classification process, providing, of course, you, that you have the right uh, information to put in there. But you can see I've included um, a screenshot of the UK Global Online Tariff, and it has a search box in there. So if you have uh, commodity codes that you want to check on, you can put the commodity code in there. It will take you straight through the description of those particular goods. Uh, and you can check that it, it fits uh, what the type of good is that you're um, involved in. Failing that, if you don't have the commodity code, you can input a description of the goods and it will give you in the sections that you can just see highlighted um, at the bottom of that screenshot. It will take you through to the options for that particular type of product um, and um, lead you through that to help you establish um, what you might see the uh, commodity code is. Um, feeling that, if you're still having issues, HMRC have a tariff classification service, it's an email service. Um, fortunately, you can only send one email per type of goods, but um, providing you give them enough information, and the required information, they will come back and give you a non-binding uh, opinion as to what they think that um, the classification of, of that particular product is. Um, moving forward from that, if you're looking at something a little bit more serious, perhaps if you have um, options that you're not sure about, which, uh, which seem to fit your goods and perhaps the duty rates or there are some licensing requirements attributed to one of the, the possibilities and not to the other, you can ask HMRC for an advanced tariff ruling. It used to be called BTI, Binding Tariff Information. But that, that requires you providing a lot more information um, on, the, on the particular product and in some cases sending them a, um, a sample, if that's possible, uh, for them to give you that tariff ruling, which is binding on HMRC and gives you some certainty that you can carry on using uh, that particular uh, commodity code. And there are a whole host of classification guides on the gov.uk website, but it can be a slightly tricky area. But classification is one of the main um, key areas that HMRC will look at on any particular order that they carry out. So if you are unfortunate enough to have um, get the letter in at some stage in the future, then um, having checked these out beforehand gives you a little um, degree of certainty that you're okay as far as uh, commodity goods are concerned. Um, just a quick exa example here. I mentioned that it's either an eight or 10 digit code um, for commodity codes. And there is a difference between an export declaration and an import declaration. If you're exporting this coffee percolator from the UK, you only need eight digits, eight digit commodity code for an export, in this case, 8419-8120. Um, the same percolator being imported uh, from outside the UK has a 10 digit commodity code. So you need 10 digits for an import, you only need eight digits for an export. In this case, it's the, the same eight digits um, as the uh, export there with an, an additional two digits at the end, which um, may vary depending on the type of product, but um, the tariff itself, if you, if you have a look at the tariff, will give you the options as to which if, uh, type of percolator uh, you might be required to fit into that. So commodity code, eight digits for exports, 10 digits for imports. Now. One of the reasons I start off with the commodity code is that, as I mentioned, it's the foundation for what might need, what liabilities you might have for duty and VAT and excise duty, any other uh, kind of payment that might um, flow from uh, your uh, decision on which commodity code to take. So it's key that if you've been using commodity codes in the past or you have a database uh, within your business, which have not been particularly um, problematic because of uh, our um, uh, the UK being part of the um, EU and the, uh, the customs union. The commodity code didn't really have the financial impact from a customs point of view, but it becomes more important now that we've left. Um, so the commodity code, my advice would be review your commodity codes, make sure 
um, that you're happy with the commodity codes. Uh, some of them may have been around or, or lying in your database for, for some years. Um, just make sure that, uh, that they are still extant and, and that they're correct. So why, why must it be correct? Um, it ensures that the correct customs charges are paid. And this is one of the areas customs will um, focus on to make sure that you're classifying your goods accurately um, and they move on from there. It provides accurate trade statistics, help establish whether the goods um, need an export license or an import license, the commodity code on the tariff will tell you whether there's a requirement of that, um, helps you identify if there are any special import or export arrangements. Uh, for example, if, if it's the type of goods, if, if, if it's dangerous goods, it may need some kind of special packing um, to move the goods uh, and the, the tariff will tell you that. The process is called classification, which is you establishing um, what the commodity code of the goods you're moving. Are. And obviously from a financial point of view, it determines, if, especially for imports, because the, there are no uh, duties chargeable on, on exports, but looking at imports, um, it determines how much duty you would be liable to pay on a straightforward import into the UK, how much VAT was attributable, and whether there are any other charges which might be associated on there. So the first part of that is, is uh, classifying your goods. Once you've, good, you've done that, the next step for HMRC uh, in, in establishing that the correct amount of duty um, has been paid and the correct amount of VAT and so on and so forth is the valuation of your goods. And again, this is one of the building blocks that HMRC use, and they will be checking these with, with a fine tooth comb in a lot of cases uh, to ensure that you, you've got your classification right and move on from there to check that you um, you're putting the correct value of those particular goods on your uh, customs declaration. Um, based on the World Trade Organization rules, um, like the classifications, um, just coincidence, there are six different methods of valuation, um, which you can uh, find on, on the globe.uk website. Um, the vast, vast majority of, of goods classified under uh, method one. Uh, and this, this method needs to be declared on a, on a customs declaration to uh, inform HMRC um, what method has been used in, in, in uh, valuating these goods. 90%, uh, that's probably quite low, it's probably higher than 90% of all goods are based on the transaction value. And the transaction value is simply the invoice value uh, that you've paid for those goods. Without going into too much detail um, in code terms, um, there can be some variations on, on um, what the transaction value is over and above an invoice value. I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. But there are other methods if that particular method doesn't fit, um, especially when there are goods which are being perhaps um, in a company where there's no charge. For a customs point of view, there is always a value to the goods and customs will always look at the uh, particular type of, of uh, product and will establish and what expect you to establish an open market value for those goods. The fact that it's free of charge to you does not mitigate you from actually declaring the full value. So the other methods um, from two to, to six um, would help you once you've been unable to use the, the transaction value. But the valuation is, is key. Um, and the mantra, I suppose, if I can call it that, is that you must ensure that the cost of the items, any insurance and any freight charges to the UK border are included in that value. Um, and the reason that I quickly mentioned uh, in court terms, just to give you an example of that, um, if your uh, supplier um, and yourself you have an agreement in place that they deliver the goods, deliver duty paid, DDP is just referred to under um, uh, the in court terms, then you can be sure that the cost to you includes the cost of the goods, it includes the insurance, and it includes any freight charges because they're delivering it to your premises, your door. Um, the difficulties come in when perhaps goods are um, supplied um, without um, the cost of insurance and freight charges uh, being included. X-Works, for example, are, are, are free to carry it. 
Um, if you're involved in um, picking up goods, say you have a German supplier and you, you actually arrange the transport and the insurance from Germany to get the goods to your premises in the UK, then you must ensure that not only the cost of the item, so whatever the value of the invoice is, you must in include an element of insurance and the freight charges that you've incurred to get those goods to the uh, UK border. So it, it's a uh, it's key point to remember, always ensure that CIF is, is the value that's used um, when you're importing those goods and instructing your um, customs agent or freight forwarder in doing that. It mentions there when insurance is, is, uh, covers the whole value of the, the um, movement of the goods, it might include uh, cost of the goods and the freight charges. You can do an apportionment as long as HMRC um, can see that you clearly um, have done some reasonable apportionment of the costs and anything beyond the UK border that uh, is chargeable is not included should you wish to do that. Um, the other area um, currently quite a hot topic uh, is around the rules of origin, um, especially with the new uh, trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. And what I uh, will do, I'll touch on the uh, free trade agreement between the EU and the UK um, a little bit later on, but I'll, I'll run through the basic rules of origin, which um, apply um, across the globe, essentially. Um, and in particular to, to individual free trade agreements. Two types of, of origin, um, non-preferential rules of origin, and this is where there are no free trade agreements in place between trading countries. So it's goods are, are, are traded and, and uh, charges are levied on what's referred to as most favoured nation basis, MFN. Um, if you're a member of the um, WCO, uh, then um, these rules of origin sorry, the WTO, these rules of origin um, will be applied to you as a member. You're in the club um, and individual members are, are restricted in what they can actually charge in most cases uh, on a duty basis um, for imports from other uh, WTO members. I'll talk about uh, the non-preferential rules um, in the slides to follow. Preferential rules, and this is something that's uh, really gained momentum at the moment, is where there, ha there are free trade agreements in place between um, customs union or trading countries. Um, the non-preferential rules of origin don't bestow any particular uh, individual reduction or, or nil rates of duty, whereas the preferential rates due. Uh, quite often, uh, the, the, the trade agreement that's in place, and, and that would include the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU, um, that the UK has, um, quite often it's, it's to do with nil rate of duty. Um, the UK government is currently negotiating um, with several countries uh, on these uh, um, new agreements and they're being added to almost on a, a weekly or a monthly basis. I think at the moment we have something like, the UK has something like 20, 27, 26 um, free trade agreements in, in place and, and that will grow. When we left the EU, obviously, um, the free trade agreements that the EU had in place around the world um, fell by the wayside and the, e the UK has to and um, has been doing uh, renegotiating those particular uh, agreements. So just to touch on um, non-preferential origin. For non-preferential origin, i.e. when you might have to um, substantiate or have a, um, your supplier substantiate that the goods originate in two different areas. If they're wholly produced in a single country uh, or if they're manufactured in a single country from products that may be from more than one country. And that's very, very usual uh, across the world at the moment and certainly across the EU. Country of origin is the place where the last substantial process of transformation took place. And this is one of the key areas and it, it can cause some issues as to whether a, a process that has been carried out at one stage in the supply chain is substantial enough for it to change its origin. Um, when it comes to wholly produced, it, it's relatively straightforward. Um, the good can be considered wholly produced in a country uh, um, when it's born and bred in that country, i.e. you've got uh, animals, cattle there, goods which are grown in a country, um, are out of the ground, minerals, etc., which are, are dug out of the ground or wholly from that particular country. And, and for fish in particular, 
caught by UK trawlers and, and are landed within UK waters, um, they are considered to be poorly produced by that particular company. Those are the simple ones, I suppose, um, because they can be demonstrated that they um, do originate uh, from that uh, particular country who's supplying them. Um, manufactured origin is slightly different. Uh, and it's, it's not uncommon, obviously, with the, to have goods manufactured in the UK from UK parts um, and parts from uh, different parts of the world, including uh, the EU. Um, but again, it comes down to the last major substantial process of transformation taking place in the UK. If that happens, then that product, despite it having components from across the world, uh, can qualify for uh, UK, uh, being of UK origin. Um, I should say at this point that um, a lot of the customs regulations and rules, um, the UK regulations are almost a mirror image of, of what um, the UK has in place, uh, sorry, the EU has in place with the Union Customs Code. The only slight difference I can think of at the top of my head is with regard to guarantees, where the EU uh, have made guarantees mandatory for some of the special procedures that they operate. The UK has decided not to make that mandatory, but for, for all intents and purposes, the rest of the UK regulations are the same as the um, Union Customs Code for the EU. So when I'm talking here about what is available to the EU, sorry, the UK, these um, particular um, aspects are also available to any um, suppliers or customers you might have in the EU. Um, so there are different rules for preferential origin, um, usually um, based around um, change of tariff heading or, or um, added value to the goods. But um, these are where the existing, there is a, a trade agreement. And, and I mentioned that the UK and the EU has a trade agreement and it's, it's covering a large part of my uh, business day at, at the moment is this looking at rules of origin. Hence, I've, I've included that quite specifically in here. But again, you've got whole, wholly produced goods if, uh, as per the, uh, the non-preference origin, took out of the ground, born and bred, and so on and so forth. But there are individual product-specific rules. Now, you have to look at these when there's a preferential um, uh, duty arrangement in place through an FTA, free trade agreement. You have to look at the individual uh, free trade agreement because they all differ in what uh, might be required to establish change of origin. Um, product specific rules will lay out um, your particular type of goods. So once you've classified the goods, you need to go to the free trade agreement to see what it actually says you need to have in place to change or, or to confirm uh, that the origin um, in, in our case would be changed to UK. The usual suspects are change of tariff heading. Uh, it usually requires that the originating components, which are manufactured into a, a subsequent different process, um, changes the tariff heading. And that is the first four digits of, of the commodity code. Um, so providing uh, whatever you're importing, um, uh, the process you're carrying out changes those first four digits, then you would qualify under the product specific rule. You have to check the product specific rule. Um, failing that, um, there is a percentage rule which may or may not be included. Um, this limits the value of what is described as non-originating goods used in the manufacture of the finished article. And it looks at um, the type of goods that are being imported uh, and what the end value of those particular finished goods are when they're sold on. Um, and they may qualify under that percentage rule, given the X-Works price and, and what the value of the non-originating goods are in there. Then you get into some slightly more complex areas, stage of production, which uh, where you have, especially for, um, for yarn to material, where you have a, um, a supply chain with various different processes being carried out even in different countries. Uh, there are some specific rulings on that. Um, in order to qualify for preferential origin, in, in other words, if you were importing goods and claiming uh, that the goods were of um, an origin that where we had a free trade agreement in place, the goods must directly uh, move from uh, the supplier to you. Um, they can't stop off, they can't go to intermediaries, but it, they must come under the di most direct rule um, from A to Z, if I can put it that way. Um, and I touched on this earlier on, there has to be some significant process that's carried out. Uh, minimal processing, there are guidelines on what constitutes um, significant processing and what constitutes minimal processing. So, um, 
from a for anybody who might have an inward processing authorization um, it's it's different um, requirement in the sense of for ip you can import goods and you can carry out some very minor um, processes to those goods and it qualifies for ip it's not the same for origin rules the uh, the process has to go beyond something which is simply polishing or cleaning or putting something in the bag uh, and there are guidelines um, I mentioned there the TCA guidance, which is the hot topic at the moment, has specific um, instructions on what constitutes minimal processing or significant processing. Um, it mentions there some products, the rules are a combination of change of tariff heading and the percentage rule. So it's important that you um, check this, the product specific rule for your types of goods to see what is required in order to change the origin. Um, the UK Free Trade Agreement, UK EU Free Trade Agreement, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement is, is, is a key area. Lots of um, inquiries on this. Um, originating and non originating material. Now, what we're talking about preferential rates of origin, uh, rates of uh, duty here. So it's either on import into the EU, if, if uh, a particular good qualifies as being of UK origin going into the EU and vice versa, anything coming into the UK from the EU, which qualifies as being of um, EU origin. You will qualify for um, a preferential duty rate uh, if, uh, if the rules are met. Non-originating materials um, are um, all, all materials which are either non-EU or non-UK, so rest of the world. Um, that's what it means by uh, non-originating materials. The emphasis of proof and this is one of the key areas, again, when we're looking at compliance with these rules and what HMRC would be looking at for you to demonstrate um, if you've claimed any uh, imported goods uh, under the EU, UK, TCA. Um, anything you can't prove um, as being of EU stroke UK origin is classed as non-originating. So you must get your ducks in a row and get documentary evidence as to, as to the the origin of the, of the goods, and that would include getting that information from your suppliers. Um, Non-material costs from the um, origin point of view, all of your additional costs um, on any processes that you're carrying out, labor, overheads, profits, et cetera, are classed as originating if you're providing those in the UK. Um, this chapter 42 um, rule, this is just a, a quick example of, of how it works. Chapter 42 of the uh, UK Global Tariff um, starts off with raw hides and, and skins, articles of leather, so on and so forth. So if you were importing um, a raw, uh, some raw leather, a raw skin uh, from Brazil, it has a commodity code of 4101. And this is, this is an example of change of tariff heading one of the um, most popular sort of uh, areas uh, in order to change, her, uh, change uh, customs heading. Undergoes manufacturing process in the UK, the end product is uh, a handbag in that particular case. It qualifies because the tariff heading changes from 4101, the new tariff heading, if you look uh, up on the UK global tariff, moves that uh, from a skin to um, a bag in this particular case to 4202. And because the product specific rule for um, the bag says you can change the origin if the originating material you've changed tariff headings, which is quite obviously it has done only one digit, but it's changed um, for those, um, uh, the finished product and qualifies as a change of tariff heading. The other example is the percentage rule based on the value of the goods. Um, starting off with this one, a guitar um, has tariff heading uh, 92, which um, includes all kinds of um, apparatus and instruments, but includes musical instruments in there as well. Um, 92 or two other string musical instruments. So if um, the guitar in this instance is, is manufactured in the UK, but if you look at the breakdown there, the body um, is, is UK sourced. Um, uh, it's worth £20 um, at, uh, at value, at purchase value. The neck um, is of Japanese origin, it's imported, it's £50 value. The pick guard is Spanish uh, and uh, is a £10 value, tuning pegs, so on and so forth. And the labour and profit to that is £15. So the, 
the total cost is for um, uh, to make things easier. Total cost um, to the the UK business is hundred pounds. Um, now, the uh, sorry, the XWorks price is hundred pounds. Um, the EU and UK origin costs are forty five pounds out of those bill of materials. The non originating uh, materials, i.e., the, the Japanese uh, neck and the uh, Chinese tuning pegs cost £55. So if you're charging £100, according to that calculation, um, £55 of that is non-originating. The guitar is not UK preferential origin. Um, you cannot now say that guitar is uh, of UK origin because it doesn't meet the percentage rule. It's over 50% of the cost. And that just gives you a flavour and an example of, of how that actually works. Um, very quickly on custom special procedures because um, we do actually do um, uh, separate um, uh, webinars and training on, on special procedures. But in order to mitigate the costs to your business, you can apply to be a customs warehouse, which will suspend the import duties and VAT on import whilst you store the goods. And if you re-export them, then there is no duty liability. If you bring the goods into the UK, you have to pay the duty and VAT at that particular point. Um, inward and outward processing, if you're receiving goods for processing and, and re-exporting them or vice versa, sending goods out, you can apply to be authorised for these particular processes uh, and that will, will mitigate the costs of uh, import duties uh, into the UK for you. Authorised use is, is quite specific. It used to be called end use and still referred to as specific use if you're involved in manufacture of a certain um, types of goods, civil aircraft, shipwork goods, fishes in there. It's very specific. You have to be uh, um, um, importing goods for that, for those particular uses, but you can be authorised there. That will save you the, um, uh, the liability of import duty. And temporary admission, bringing goods in, um, which are never intended to be of a, a permanent nature, you can import under temporary admission. I've got a slide on that just coming up. Um, just a, a point I, I've added in here, because it, it's not strictly speaking a special procedure, but it's something that has uh, came to prominence um, since we left the EU with goods moving from the EU um, to the UK and vice versa. Any goods that were previously in free circulation uh, in the UK, um, which were exported to the EU, for example, uh, can be re-imported without charge under return goods relief. It has a specific customs procedure code that goes under the customs declaration. Um, the goods usually have to be returned without being altered. Um, Three-year rule applies, so you, um, they should have um, been no longer than three years having left the UK. That can be ex extended in certain circumstances. You must be able to prove that the original um, goods were exported, so if you send those goods out and they're coming back, if you have the export declaration, that's enough for you to not have to pay import duty for goods that are coming back into the UK. And um, return goods relief is claimed at the time of import. Uh, and again, this is a point to bear in mind that return goods relief works the other way as well. Goods being returned into the EU, which were originally supplied by them, can qualify for return goods relief from any import duty into the EU, providing you've got the correct records uh, in place. Um, temporary admission. Temporary admission uh, is, is usually around things like works of art or machinery and equipment, which are temporarily imported um, into the UK, for example. Um, but never intended to stay uh, for any long period of time uh, and will eventually be shipped back to the originating um, uh, country, um, usually up to 24 months. Um, but that, again, can be extended if the goods need to be uh, in the UK uh, for any extended period. Um, no, li no liability due to import duties, providing um, goods are properly discharged from temporary admission and you use the right codes, et cetera, when the goods um, are eventually removed from the UK and, and exported. Customs declaration. Um, just a brief few words on the customs declaration, because this is the area that, again, customs will be looking at when they, they come along um, and, and carry out any kind of uh, audit on you. And the key point here is that the EORI number, going back to one of the very first slides, a customs declaration made, made under a, a specific EORI number by your agent or broker, let's just describe that as you as a business, 
appointed an agent or a freight forwarder um, to do your uh, declarations, HMRC will always come back to you as the importer, exporter, and not your agent. There are some can be an exception to that, but in most cases, this is the key point to bear in mind. It's your EORI number that's on the declaration. HMRC holds you responsible for that, even though you're using a third party business partner to do the declaration on your behalf. And you can do the, the declarations yourself as the importer or exporter. Um, you can use a customs agent or a freight forwarder, which is the vast majority uh, of, of our businesses use. Uh, and the other alternative is the fast parcel operator, FPO, BHLs, and Royal Mail of this world, et cetera. Uh, as I mentioned there, which I've touched on, um, it's the legal responsibility of the exporter or the importer. So it's, it's important to keep checking with your um, agent or forwarder to make sure that the declarations they're doing on your behalf are accurate. Um, it mentions there, they can act as either direct or indirect rep representatives. So in the vast, mass, vast majority of cases, your agent forwarder is a direct representative, uh, which means that you are wholly responsible for everything that goes on that declaration. Um, they are never responsible for any uh, issues that might arise with customs um, should they uh, pop up. If they're an indirect representative, that's something different, but it's, it's not very... Um, uh, it's not very often that they agree to sign up as an indirect representative, but it does happen. It makes them jointly and severally liable um, with you as the importer or exporter um, if, you, um, if there are any issues. So you can see why perhaps the, um, uh, the agents and forwarders don't particularly like the idea of being um, an indirect representative. So key pieces of information um, that you uh, need for a declaration, and again, bear in mind, um, I've touched on these. You've got your Yori number in there. The value, free on board value for, for exports, you need to have, make sure that that's uh, in place uh, and is accurate. The commodity code, whether it's an import or an export, um, that you've got, uh, you've given um, correct commodity code and a, a, a good description. The customs procedure code is a seven digit code which goes on to your declaration, which tells customs what you're doing with these goods, whether it's a straightforward import or a straightforward export, or whether you have some kind of special procedure uh, and that you can suspend the, the, the uh, payment of the goods under those special procedures. Quite a lot of different CPC codes, but these are key areas uh, for a, a customs declaration. And this is just an example. Um, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to get a, a copy of this particular presentation. And this, this is a useful tool to take you through the, the various boxes um, on the, the customs declaration. Not always um, do you need to complete all of the boxes. In fact, never do you have to complete all of the boxes. But the key areas, consignor, consignee, the declarant's name, country of origin, which we've talked about, and the reasons for that, uh, values, goods description, commodity codes, so on and so forth. So it gives you an idea of, of how um, Currently under Chief SAD, um, single administrative document C88 form is constructed. Now, good practice. This is the bit where it comes round, back around to compliance. Um, you need to keep um, control of what's being done in your name uh, as an importer and an exporter. You should always ask your agent for a copy of any declaration that they make on your behalf for your records and you should check that it be information and the data that's being put on there is, is um, accurate. For imports, you need to get an E2 NB acceptance advice, that's the electronic copy. For exports, it's the goods departure advice, which is an S8 electronic uh, document. So ask for those two particular um, documents from your agent. You can apply to HMRC for management support system data. This is under Chief CDS apparently is, is likely to give you this information for free. You can get a monthly printout for a fee of £240 for your imports, for example, uh, which allows you to do those checks um, on an Excel spreadsheet and makes it very easy for you to make those declarations uh, checks. So just a very quick um, schematic, if I can call it. This is how the import system works. Import declaration at the moment going into chief. Um, by your order agent, value of the goods, customs procedure codes, 
commodity code in any licenses, keep it bits of area, um, areas that need to be input on the rate. Chief has the customs tariff, the UK global tariff in there. It checks your commodity code. That commodity code will relate a, a, a customs duty rate and the customs procedure code will tell chief what you're doing with those goods, whether chief needs to charge you directly before you can remove the goods. So it calculates all of those um, duties. If you've got a deferment account that makes a charge against it, if not, you have to pay up front. But it profiles releases uh, goods for the next stage. Once the goods are, are, are released, um, they release the free circulation, you've paid all of the, the duties and taxes. If you have any of the special procedures, then the CPC will reflect that and um, the duty will be suspended pending you telling Chief what's happening further down the line um, in that area. But there is something called the uh, new computerized transit system for transit. I, I won't go into that at the moment. Um, it it's, sits alongside Chief um, but is available for movement of goods across the EU and other satellite countries. Uh, so the Frontier Export Declaration is, is quite simple. Your agent or forwarder will put in uh, a pre-lodged entry in the Chief. Once the goods arrive at the port, Chief is updated um, and sends uh, messages from there, usually permission to progress. Yes, you can load these goods onto the vessel. Um, if not, they might ask for some uh, documentary or they might do a physical examination, which is not very often, but they have that option, obviously. And once the goods leave the UK, the port operator then goes back in the chief and sends a departure message. And that's the message that I mentioned, the SA to print out that you need uh, as proof of export. Now, coming on to the, the sort of final part, if you like, um, there have been, some instances currently, I know that HMRC are, are currently looking at um, some of the issues that might have been caused with promise leaving uh, the EU from the 1st of January and the transitional arrangements. And they really are gearing up to um, getting out after COVID because COVID has caused um, um, some problems for them actually uh, working from home and not being able to do face-to-face -face audits, but that is changing. Um, and they will be um, coming out to check that, A, if you've been involved in delayed declarations, that you've done the correct supplementary declaration or you've actually done a, a declaration at all. Um, they will be looking at um, wrong or missing supplementary de declarations in those, in those particular cases. And they have, not only do they have civil penalties which they can uh, impose for any errors that they describe, the maximum penalty there is two, two and a half thousand pounds. Um, to the current contravention, that means one individual error. So that can very quickly mount up for significant irregularities or a thousand pound if it's not considered to be significant, but it is the contravention. So that could be a number of different um, contraventions on one particular audit. Um, you can do a voluntary disclosure. If you look at uh, your business and, and do your own review um, and find these errors, you can voluntarily disclose them and avoid uh, any prospect or, of um, a, a civil penalty. Um, and they also have a civil, civil evasion penalty, I should say, um, where dishonesty is involved. I won't go into that too much, but it can involve them also charging you 100% uh, fine up uh, to the value of the duty. And HMRC are now looking at getting the wheels in motion for doing these kind of audits. So it's, it's um, it's, it's a good practice to start looking at areas where you think you might have weaknesses now uh, and, and get prepared before they actually come along um, to knock on the door. So as far as Make UK and myself is involved, um, we have the, uh, the Brexit uh, helpline. There's an email address there and the telephone number, and you can see the, um, um, the web page for the EU hub. But it, it ranges, really. It, all of the things that I'm doing at the moment at Comment UK, um, then from a quick phone call, um, just to resolve queries over 10 or 15 minutes. Um, if you're looking for something more personal, uh, tailored to your individual business, uh, you want to talk about supply chains and mitigations and what you can do to put um, compliance in place so that you're not caught out. Um, customs training and development, um, we can offer that if, if you want any particular aspects of customs and it's across the board. Um, any particular aspect of customs you want to go into more depth and have some training and accreditation for. 
um, options to mitigate costs. We can look at supply chains um, and say, look, if you change what you're doing from here to there, then that would save you some money. And if you're looking at any of the um, authorizations that HMRC Customs offer, then we can also offer uh, assistance with application forms, et cetera, to get you through the process. They're not always the easiest forms in the world. For those of you who might have um, already looked at some of the processes, you'll understand that. But if you need any help with those, then certainly um, make UK out of there to help. I think with that, I think um, I may need to hand over before questions. I think Aaron has, has got a couple of poll cool questions for you. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Keith. And hopefully everyone on the call found that useful. Um, before we jump across to the Q&A section, uh, thank you very much for submitting your questions in the Q&A and we'll um, answer as many as possible. I'm just going to pop up a poll. Um, we'd appreciate if you're able to answer it um, just to give us a bit more insight um, and see if we can follow up after the call. Um, I'll keep this open for two minutes and then we can go over and see if we can answer as many of the questions in the Q&A function as possible. Okay, Aaron, I think we should move on to the questions now. Is that enough of that? Um, yeah, no, let's let's move on. Uh, thank you very much for everyone um, answering and that will feed into our message. So thank you very much. Okay, so let's start with the questions. Um, Keith, how should goods be valued if they're faulty and then they're being returned to the manufacturer under warranty with a replacement supplied, i.e. not for repair, so OP relief isn't relevant? Oh, yeah, OP, if you're authorised for OP, um, you can use OP. It's, it's quite flexible uh, procedure. Um, but there is a special procedure for uh, and a customs procedure code, which is applicable um, for importing goods which are being imported for repair. They're not actually being processed. They're just being put back into a, a fit state to, to be operational. Um, but IP is certainly an option. If you're authorised for IP, it makes things a lot easier, actually. Um, but there is a special um, customs procedure code, which off the top of my head, I, I can't think of, but I could uh, look up for you, um, which you can bring goods in where you're not actually um, um, processing them in any way, shape or form. And in, in, in some ways, the, the, it could qualify, and this is where customs can get a slightly bit complex, is that it could be done under return goods relief. If those goods were originally... Um, supplied by a UK supplier and they're coming back in for recalibration, for example, then you can use return goods relief as well to um, mitigate the cost of having to pay import duty for goods which were originally in free circulation in the UK. So there are a couple of options there. Thank you, Keith. Perfect. Uh, next question. Would samples, uh, I'm guessing product samples, uh, be valued under method two where there is no sale? Yeah, samples have their own sort of little niche. Um, the thing about samples, uh, and yes, um, you can import goods under the, uh, uh, again, a customs procedure code, which tells chief these are samples and call it the goods qualify as samples, in which case um, uh, the chief will not charge any duty on those. The thing about samples is they must be uh, not uh, be able to be used. So if I can use the example of a pair of trainers, let's say you were a, um, a, um, a retailer of, of sporting goods and you were looking at a new um, line of trainers which were coming from the Far East. If that sample or those samples came through, and again, um, it's to moot point, you can't import 10,000 pairs of trainers and call them samples, but if you imported half a dozen different types, 
those particular samples have to be um, marked in some way that makes them unusual. For example, a pair of trainers, you could um, use them as samples or import them as samples, despite the fact they've got a hole in the sole, which means you can't sell them on. If it's, if it's some kind of um, hardware item, then it's marked and scratched, so it's non-resaleable. Samples have their own little niche also, but um, the valuation is one thing. The, the, the fact that you're importing them and as a sample means that whatever value you put on them, um, then you won't be charged any uh, import duty because of the customs procedure code that you're using. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Keith. Okay, this is um, some advice wanted on valuation, which obviously wasn't an issue pre-Brexit. If yeah. after you've imported and declared to UK Customs, your supplier issues an additional invoice because the original price was incorrect or needs to be adjusted, you'll likely have to inform UK Customs as an additional duty tax may be due, is that right? That would be right, yeah. I mean, there's a national clearance hub in, mm -hmm. in uh, Manchester now. It, it does alternate between Salford and Manchester. Um, and you can actually amend um, a customs uh, import declaration in the sense of making a supplementary declaration. The National Clearance Hub in, in Manchester would advise you how to do that, but you can make a uh, supplementary payment, if you like, uh, in the case where that actually happens, where you genuinely had a, a value for the goods when they were imported and that subsequently changed. Uh, next question. Uh, when, when you notify your direct representative of any errors on the declaration, do you still have the responsibility to make sure the corrections are made to the declaration? Yes. It, it all falls back to, if you're the importer, and this is what we're talking about, because the, the duty liabilities and VAT liabilities are on import, um, export, okay, you're getting a zero rate from your VAT perspective, but there's no customs duty on there. So if we're looking at imports, it's always you as the importer who will be held responsible. So if there's an error, um, you've found an error, you've gone back to your forwarder or agent and told them to correct that, there, is a, there are uh, means uh, to do that, then if they don't do it, then HMRC will come to you um, for whatever that difference might be. Yeah. That's perfect. Hilary, I think your, your mic's on mute. Oops. I yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Done that after a year and a half. Um, is import VAT ultimately a cost to UK business? This company has no special procedure in place, but imports free issue goods into the UK to process and subsequently export. Um, should we pay import VAT due to no special procedure being in place? If we do initially have to pay the import VAT, or deal through PVA or our VAT returns, can you confirm it's then recoverable on the subsequent export? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming a little bit here that if your business is importing um, goods for processing that, you as the UK business never take ownership of the goods. The goods, uh, I'm assuming, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but, or, or I can pick this up afterwards, if you never own the goods, the goods don't belong to you. They always belong to your uh, customer who you're processing them for. There was a ruling at the back end of 2020 on the VAT side of it. I'm not a VAT expert. I know I, I, I do repeat this from time to time, but there was a ruling that said, if you don't um, own the goods on import, then you are not entitled to deduct the import VAT. So this is, inward processing has what's called a VAT only authorization. So if you're importing goods belonging to a German company, there's a nil rate of duty. You might think, well, that's fine. There's no duty. The goods will come in. I will claim the import VAT, uh, sorry, the import uh, VAT back. The VAT man, the VAT people will not allow that if they find it. Those goods don't belong to you. You're not entitled to the input tax. That's why you can apply for and be authorized for inward processing for VAT only. What it means then is the import VAT is suspended. You never have to pay it. And providing you re-export those goods back to your, say, your German customer, um, then you, you're never liable for that import VAT. But there was two rulings given at the end of 2020. And I get a feeling that HMRC are going to be quite hot on that because it, they realise that a lot of businesses have just imported goods to process, which they don't own put the VAT through as input tax on the VAT return uh, and thought they were doing the right thing. The ruling says otherwise, you're not entitled to that input tax. And 
um, you would have a job, I think, um, trying to claim that uh, import VAT back uh, from, from HMRC on the VAT side, I would guess, yeah. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, there are a few questions we haven't got to, but we will get answers and we will make sure that anybody who put, puts um, a question in the Q&A um, gets an answer as soon as we can download them. So I um, promise we will do that. Um, thank you for um, coming along today and listening. Thank you to Keith um, for your wonderful presentation. Hope everybody found it really helpful. We'll be running a few more sessions in the coming um, weeks and months, and we'll make sure that details are emailed across to you as soon as we have them. So thank you very much, everybody, and good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.